16, I they had a lifetime of experience as a very horrible student and not a very good person. I, I had terrible grades in school. Everybody in school was convinced that I had severe learning disabilities. And so uh, as a result, I was kind of shuffled along in school. At 16, I dropped out of school and I and got kicked out of my house. <laughs> And I lived in my station wagon for a while until I could get things straight. Well, I got things straight because after getting out of that environment that was so toxic for me in school, I found that I could actually have conversations with people that didn't see me as somebody who was broken or somebody who was disturbed. Instead, they saw me as a normal person and they talked to me about normal ideas and they introduced me to books. So I began reading some books about setting goals, about changing your mind to change your reality, and I committed to doing exactly that. Within a year after leaving school, I entered college. I was entering college a year earlier than my former classmates had graduated uh, from high school. And so I started off as kind of a wonderkind in college, whereas in high school I was just a, an absolute nobody with no future. I began studying computers and got into uh, computer uh, programming and business analysis. And within a couple of years of attending college, I left college in order to join my future as a computer programmer. I worked uh, in a small computer company that did business for small businesses. We showed them how to change their practices and utilize computers in order to improve their bottom line. I did that for about 15 years, and I, after 15 years, I realized that I had become the expert that I had hoped to become. I'd also achieved some of my other goals. One of my early goals was to uh, have a family, a good family, and to, to find a beautiful woman to marry. Now this was a, a far-fetched goal because as this uh, pothead dropped out, I had no possibility of doing that. But it turns out I actually did find a beautiful woman to marry. She was my first wife. Uh, fortunately, she is also my current wife and we've been married for 40 years. We've raised three great kids. So after being an employee and becoming an expert in my field, I went and started my own business, and this is in 1994. In 1994, I became a solopreneur and started uh, Ad Hoc Information Systems, which I have been working on, uh, that, that has been my company ever since then. One of the things that I, I did when I started speaking with Lori's group here is I talked to some of the people afterwards and one of the persons that I spoke with was an IT person who had only been in IT for about three or four years so he was just at the beginning of his career arc and he said something that really struck me as odd he after speaking with him for a while he said where did you get the courage to do what you've done and I had never ever thought of myself as having courage. But he, he said, you know, I don't know any IT person who I work with that would have the courage, first of all, to be speaking in front of people. I don't know any IT person that would have the courage to go out and start their own business. Um, you've shown a lot of courage in your life. And so I had to think about it, being an IT guy, I had to understand what courage was. And so I went to that uh, great repository of all things, and I Googled <laughs> courage. <laughs> and the first thing I came up with was a quote from Anais Nin. Anais Nin said that life expands and contracts in proportion to our courage. And I thought, okay, that, that sounds great, but it doesn't explain what courage is. It doesn't explain how to get it. So I was still at a loss. So I dug deeper into the research. And I, I looked up courage in the dictionary. And it's the first thing that I saw there confused me because it said courage was a noun. 
And I said, is that, can that be right? Because in school, I learned that a noun is a person, a place, or a thing. Well, courage obviously isn't a person. It's not a place. Is it a thing? Is courage something that you can go buy? Is, is courage something that you can pull off of a shelf, open up, and put on? If you have a lot of courage, are you able to give courage to somebody else? I don't think it is. So I don't think it acts like a thing. I thought then, well, maybe courage is a verb, an action. But then I started thinking that there are a lot of actions that you do that require courage, whether it's proposing to a woman for marriage or uh, taking your 15-year-old out to teach him how to drive. <laughs> These things take courage, and yet they're completely different actions. So what is it that uh, is courage, and how do we get to it? A another example of courage that I saw just a couple of days ago on the television. Does anybody here know the name Joshua Jones? Joshua Jones was one of the three people that tackled the high school shooter in, uh, in Colorado. When he was, originally he said they, he didn't want to give his name out, but yesterday he started doing interviews. And they asked him what he was thinking when that happened, and his response was, I wasn't thinking. Tunnel vision and adrenaline is crazy, is what he said. And that's exactly what it was. We saw that, those actions, or his actions, as an act of courage, but he did not see it as an act of courage. He saw it as simply fulfilling the commitment to the purpose, and his purpose was trying to save his friends. So that's what courage is. It's, it's a byproduct of having a commitment to a purpose. And I brought a story here that I would like to relate to you. I received this letter uh, in September of last year. And as you listen to it, I'd like you to think about that idea of courage and see if, if you can tell how, how he exemplifies the words of uh, Henry David Thoreau, who said, go confidently toward your dreams and you will be able to achieve the lives you imagine. He writes, a few years ago, I was in London filming a TV series about magic and science. The flat I was staying in was a charming one bedroom on a quiet street just outside the city. There was a cafe and a used bookshop next door, and the train station was just a short walk around the corner. The show I was working on was a science show cleverly disguised to look like a magic show. We created and performed incredible magic effects all over the world. Magic effects that were made entirely possible through science. In one episode, we used light and sound to create the illusion that water was flowing upwards. In another, we used a sound frequency only heard by children to create the illusion of superhuman memory. Each episode allowed us to talk about and explore the incredible scientific principles that were at the core of these beautiful uh, magical effects. Some of these turned out to be very dangerous. One night I was startled awake by a phone call from one of my producers. They had been filming a large stunt with one of the other performers and something had gone terribly wrong. James had been injured during the stunt and was being taken to the hospital. I forget the exact words, but the next part of our conversation went something like this. The producer said, James is fine, but his arm is a bit hurt. Apparently the producer was an Irishman from Bangladesh. <laughs> he's supposed to film another stunt soon, but because he's injured, he won't be able to do it. Will you do it in his place? Um, well, what's the stunt exactly? It's a bungee jump. I've never actually done a bungee jump before. What's the angle? We're gonna cut the cord in half. 
And then, and then you jump with the cord cut in half. Yes. And how do I also not end up in the hospital? Well, that's easy. A phone book. After a few moments of silence, the producer continued. He explained things. I thought about it and said yes. I got up, I made coffee, and I began to study the science that was involved. I didn't sleep. Less than 48 hours later, I was standing on a small platform 165 feet above the pavement. A live audience gazing up at me from below. Almost a dozen high-definition cameras were pointed at me, including one that was mounted on a drone hovering over the crowd. In the window of a high-rise next to the crane that was holding our platform stood a naked man sipping a cup of tea, watching. Hmm. Attached to my ankles was a bungee cord that had been cut in half. A phone book was then attached to each end of the severed cord. The pages of each book were then interwoven, one on top of the other, until the entire book was interspliced. The science says that the friction of those pages should prevent the two books from sliding apart. So the books should stick together and prevent me from falling to my death, theoretically. The crowd down below began to shout, 10, 9, 8, 7. As they counted down, I couldn't help but wonder, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> I've been interested in magic since I was a kid. My dad showed me my first magic trick and I was hooked. When I was 16, I booked myself into a small theater and my dad helped me organize a large publicity stunt to promote it. I made the front page of the newspaper, sold out the theater, and learned that I could have big dreams and big ambitions. And that I could not only have those big dreams and big ambitions, but I could work to achieve them. My parents taught me how to play, and they, most importantly, they taught me how to play with purpose. As my dad developed the tools and the systems that he now has in his book, he shared them with me. I was lucky. Throughout my career, I've used various parts of his system to organize my play, to organize my life, in order to accomplish the things I dreamt of as a kid. And ultimately, that's how I ended up hosting a Discovery Channel TV show doing insanely dangerous things. The naked man in the window was still watching, and I was shaking. The audience below was continued shouting, six, five, four, three. Loudspeakers amplified their shouts, and my heart skipped a beat. I looked out across the spectacular lights of London. The view was stunning and fell forward. Gravity pulled me down and I lost my breath, but then I felt a gentle tug on my feet and a gradual slow in my fall, and I bounced upwards. The books held, the science worked, and the bungee jump was a success. Truly one of the most thrilling moments of my life. That uh, letter was written to me, uh, as I said, last September. I have a confession to make. I was one of the characters in that story. I know it's hard to recognize me now with all my clothes on. Actually, <laughs> rock us a flow. There you go. Thank you, Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Don't pity me. So uh, he wrote that to me so that I could include it in my second edition of my book, The Achievement Protocol which I, I put out, published last October. So the Achievement Protocol uh, is my encapsulation of all of the techniques that are required to achieve any of your life goals. Proven not only through my own life, my son's life, and all the many lives that, that I've helped coach along the way. I think that if you look at his actions in that story, you'll be able to see what Henry David uh, Thoreau told us about in his book Walden, he said if you go confidently in the direction of your dreams, you'll be able to achieve the, the 
lives that you imagine. And that's what I would like to leave you with today. I would like you to understand that courage is not something that you have to get from someplace else. It's not something that you have to be born with. Courage is, is not a noun that you can take and accumulate. It's not a verb that you can check off on your to-do list. But courage really is the byproduct of being committed to a purpose. And if you're committed to the purpose, then you will have the courage and you will see that life happens the way Ralph Waldo Emerson told us when he said that the world will make way for the person who knows where he's going. <laughs>